It's always an exciting task to preach from a text in Scripture which is very familiar. And there's probably no portion of Scripture more familiar to us in this room than the 23rd Psalm. For many of you, that was the first Scripture you committed to memory. And yet this Psalm, as one matures in life, can only grow richer and richer in significance. It's great to be able to have something that is 3,000 years old that's still ministering. If you were to find an art treasure that was 3,000 years old, believe me, you would have quite a considerable possession in your hand. And yet when we look through the pages of the scripture to this 23rd Psalm and recognize that its antiquity is close to 3,000 years of age, and then you begin to calculate in your mind how many persons over the centuries these words have come to as a blessing and assurance of the control of God. How many persons have gone out of this life with a faith in God, with the psalm of the shepherd on their lips as they died, or with the psalm of the shepherd on someone else's lips, reading to the person as they passed in the presence of God. It is a beautiful thing. One preacher of another another generation said of the 23rd Psalm, It has filled the whole world with melodious joy, greater than the heart can conceive. Blessed be the day on which this psalm was born. It has charmed more griefs to rest than all the philosophies of the world. Nor is its work done. It will go on singing to your children and to their children through all the generations of time. Nor will it fold its wings till the last pilgrim is safe and time ended. And then it shall fly back to the bosom of God whence it issued and sound on, mingled with all those sounds of celestial joy, which make heaven musical forever. Let's read the 23rd Psalm together, and I'll be reading from the RSV and the biblical text uh, in the pew rack in front of you, if you'd like to turn with it, and shall we read together in unison from this great Psalm of the Shepherd. Shall we begin? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In these next few weeks, as we are sharing from some great psalms together, I've chosen to title the series, Singing in Psalms. We use the phrase sometimes, singing in tongues, or singing in the spirit, and also singing in the mind, or with the mind. But in Ephesians chapter 4, Paul talks about what it is to be full of the spirit. He says, do not be drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the spirit, addressing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody to the Lord with your heart. Singing in psalms. It's a scriptural way of really encouraging one another in our Christian journey. You know, I found in my conversations with individuals uh, who are going through times of difficulty that it's really important for us in the moments when we are the most down or the most depressed or when we feel like we have no time or no song to sing at all, that at that very moment we lift our hearts in a word of song to the Lord. Indeed, I really can substantiate from the scripture that music is a divinely ordained way whereby God can release us from troubles and problems. We find how even in the Old Testament, Saul leaned heavily upon the instrumentality of David with his harp and with his lyrics to solace his soul when he was in a time of great trouble. And more recently in the book of Acts, we saw how when Paul and Silas were in jail in the city of Philippi, In the middle of the night, they lifted their voice in song to the Lord. And if you want to know really how to begin to lift depression or lift grief in your life, release to the Lord a song. 
sometimes the aspect of being daily filled with the Spirit is relegated to a mystical level. And yet Paul brings it down in Ephesians 4 to such a common sense approach. A way of continuing to be filled with the Spirit is to address one another singing in psalms, making melody in your heart to the Lord. Now, when you're in trouble, you need to sing. And according to the uh, best traditions which surround this psalm, perhaps its historical origin owes to 2 Samuel chapter 15, when David's beloved son, Absalom, has revolted against him, and David has been forced to flee Jerusalem, crosses the brook, the brook Kidron, and goes out into the wilderness. And evidently, sometime in his experience at that juncture, according to tradition, he wrote the Song of the Shepherd, in which what he is really doing as he's on the run, without a de perhaps a decent night's sleep often, and without the kind of uh, courtesies and amenities that he has had in his court life, his mind reverts to the childhood days when he had served as a shepherd. And how many times, by the way, when you're going through a difficult experience, for those of you that are older, your mind is solaced by a memory from your youth. And he is going to begin to lift some of these heavy troubles that are surrounding him through the construction of a hymn of praise to the Lord. This Psalm 23 is what you might call a very subjective song of worship. Its emphasis is upon personal experience. Now, as you go through our hymnal, you'll basically find two types of songs. Some we call hymns and some we call gospel songs. And perhaps the best way to differentiate between a hymn and a gospel song is that a hymn is an address of praise to God, whereas a gospel song more frequently speaks to us about how God has worked in our lives. An example of a hymn is, O oh, worship the King, all glorious above. And we're not talking about our subjective experience at that point and how we feel. We're simply saying, praise be to God. And then there are gospel songs like, Oh, say, but I'm glad, I'm glad. Oh, say, but I'm glad. And we're talking about me and how God's been at work in our lives. And sometimes uh, we're a little reluctant to sing subjective songs because we may come into the sanctuary and the song leader may say, Turn to page so-and-so and sing, Oh, say, but I'm glad. And you've just had a, a very tough day. And you don't feel like singing, Oh, say, but I'm glad. Because you're really not glad. And uh, the idea of rejoicing and it is joy unspeakable and full of glory just passes over you like, you know, so much nothingness. So frequently when you're in that kind of an attitude, you'd rather sing a hymn of praise to God. It doesn't matter how turbulent I am right now. Let's praise God. He's unchanging. He's everlasting. And, and let's forget the subjective element in our experience. And yet, very precisely... What David is doing in this psalm is saying that there is an experiential part to worship as well. And that uh, we need not be hesitant in our singing to use the personal pronouns, I and me and my. Someone defined that one of the worst songs that's ever been written was I Come to the Garden Alone, because in that song they used the personal pronoun so much. And uh, this individual said that what believers really want to do when they gather together for worship is subconsciously they want to worship themselves. So they sing songs which have meaning for them but not to God. And we should only sing songs which have meaning to God. But yet I think that kind of an attitude is corrected by the 23rd Psalm. For, you, for in those six short verses, the personal pronoun I, me, or my are mentioned 17 times. 17 times. And it's very fascinating. If the tradition surrounding the writing of this psalm is an accurate one, it means that by faith, David was singing security in the midst of a, of a situation in his life where all the external environment would tend to suggest to him that the situation was totally insecure and out of control. But he lifts his song as a song of faith to the Lord. And it's great to sing of what the Lord is doing in our lives. Well, this Psalm 23 provides for us a picture of the Lord as our shepherd and the Lord as our host. The theme of God as our shepherd is seen in the first four verses of the Psalm. And then the metaphor changes in verses 5 and 6 where the Lord becomes our host. The first four verses, perhaps uh, the theme is to more describe the journey through life. And verses 5 and 6, God as host, describe more what happens at the end of the day 
When the journey is coming to an end, both the end of the day in the literal sense and the end of the day in the figurative sense, when the journey of life itself is done. The key phrase which runs throughout the psalm, particularly the first four verses in respect to God our shepherd, is the phrase, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And then reasons are given as to why we need not want. You know, I've taken this phrase, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want, and I've put the reverse on it. If I want, then perhaps I am not making the Lord my shepherd. If there is unfulfilled anxiety in my life, then have I really made him my shepherd. For the relationship with the Lord is one which casts out all anxiety and unwholesome fear. Now that's not a, just a process where you snap your fingers and all of a sudden all your anxiety and unwholesome fear leaves. But a gradual resting in the security of the Lord begins to knock out all that sense of wanting. If we let other things in life be the controlling instrument, be the shepherd of our lives, then you know you're going to have want. If life is being motivated around living by your vocation and living for your work, you're going to have unfulfilled desires and, and a constant feeling of, of unrest. If success is your shepherd, and that is the principle by which you guide your life, there's going to be dissatisfaction in your experience. Or if money is your shepherd, or if drugs are your shepherd, or if other things are in the controlling uh, panel of your life, then there will be want. But the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. The fact that the Lord is our shepherd suggests to us that we are sheep. And that, perhaps, for those of you that know sheep rather well, may be initially a rather uncomplimentary sort of a, a thing. Uh, for those of you who haven't been brought up on a farm, sheep in pictures look very wonderful, and, and I would imagine everybody, if they could get away with the codes in Costa Mesa and Newport and other towns, probably little kids would want a sheep in their backyard because they look so pretty. But yet sheep, as we know, are some of the dumbest animals alive. And I don't know... If we should really press this metaphor that David is meaning here that uh, sheep are dumb and I think more he's talking about the shepherd, but we should recognize that uh, as Isaiah puts it, uh, the sheep uh, have a tendency to stray. All we like sheep, Isaiah says, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And a sheep is something, an animal, which cannot possibly sustain life unless there is someone who has taken a shepherding interest in it. A sheep will not survive because he has no natural defenses so that a prowler, uh, a vicious animal of some kind, can very easily take his life. Unlike the deer, he cannot run away from trouble. No defenses. And stupid enough to need to be led to places where grass can be eaten and where water can be drunk. The sheep on his own cannot survive. We really had an illustration of this this last weekend because we've got a little dog, which in many respects is like a sheep. He is the stupidest animal going. For those of you that know and have seen Little Boomer, he's a white poodle that has been in our home for over eight years. And Friday afternoon, he got away. And, uh, you know, when you've had something for eight years, you just don't let something walk out. At least my wife does not anyway. She's the good shepherd out in search of the sheep. And we tracked and tracked and rode bicycles and drove cars and I don't know how many man hours we put into trying to find that dog. He, and, and as I was preparing the shepherd song, I kept thinking, Lord, how truly this dog is a representative of a sheep. That dog could not survive if it were not for living within our family. About 11 o'clock last night, somebody called me and told me that they had him in their house and we, uh, you know, the story had a good ending, just like the 23rd Psalm does. But, you know, what, a, what an illustration to guide our lives by. We're, w God sees life from the standpoint that we, with all of our intelligence, uh, really cannot survive. We must have someone who is watching out for us. And if we don't, we may think that we're making it. We may have all the trappings of what account for success. But yet... We are really lost and spiritually starving. I shall not want. 
the shepherd provides some reasons, or David, rather, in respect to the shepherd, provides reasons in our lives why we do not want. There are three in the first four verses, reasons why the sheep need not want. One is that the shepherd leads the sheep to those things which meet his needs. In respect to the sheep, the needs are for food and drink. In respect to us as persons, the needs the Lord leads us to are not only those physical things, but also the things which meet the needs of our inner man. He leads, he makes me lie down in green pastures. In the arid wastes of the wilderness, one needed to know where the green pastures were. The sheep could not find them on his own. And sheep are such animals that they will not drink beside waters which are roaring or troubled. They would drink before that which is a still pool. I've often thought in my own life how frequently the Lord has led me to want to drink by still waters. That uh, when we're in a time of turbulence, we seek for that which is very calm. He leads me. He restores my soul. The Lord provides for our inner needs. And, of course, he does this in beautiful ways, which, uh, because we use the word so often, almost seem to be trite and almost appear as if they don't have answers because they have been used. But yet the way in which the shepherd restores our soul, basically, is through what we feed upon through his word and through prayer and through bringing that background of individual attention to his word and to prayer together with the other believers and sharing a life in common. A shepherd does not exist that he might simply herd one sheep, but it is the sheep as a community which the Lord is leading to safe pastures and quiet water. And so the Lord himself, through the action of his word within our lives, and what a, what a release his word is as we turn to it in times of need, and through prayer and through the community of believers is constantly, as we let him, restoring our soul. So we don't want, because inwardly there is that satisfaction of knowing God is in control. We also don't want because the shepherd provides for our direction. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Or he leads me in the right ways. The paths. Not leading us... Uh, in, a, in an unaccustomed way, but sheep um, are uh, evidently such, uh, um, uh, I want to use the word dumb again, and I guess I'll have to, such dumb animals that uh, maybe they don't even uh, um, uh, file down a well-traveled trail, that even going across something which has been traveled many, many times by the sheep themselves, unless the shepherd is there, they will stray from the well-defined path. And we do not want... Because as we allow the Lord to be our shepherd, and that's the difference between us and the sheep, the shepherd is imposed upon the sheep. But Jesus invites us to allow him to come in and to be the good shepherd. So we choose our shepherd, and from then on, we're in under his direction and his guidance. What a comfort this is to know that in the decisions of life, he is with us and shepherding us. And we all have a difficulty, don't we, in making decisions. Think of the story of the man who just had gotten into the army and uh, he was assigned uh, to do some uh, kitchen police uh, sort of work, and the sergeant set him down before a huge stack of potatoes. And uh, there were two bins, and he said, I want you to go through and sort these potatoes and throw the bad ones into this bin and throw the good ones into this bin. And he left him. Two hours later, the sergeant come back, comes back, and the man is still sitting there with the first potato in his hand, having not done anything. And the sergeant said, oh, what's the matter? Is something wrong? Are you ill? How come you haven't done this work? And uh, is the work too hard for you? In kind of a sarcastic sort of way. And the man said, no, it isn't the work that's too hard. He said, it's the decisions that are killing me. And uh, face that, alternatives in life. How can we know that the shepherd is leading us in the right direction? There are three ways. Really by, first of all, submitting wholeheartedly to the leadership of the shepherd. By saying to the Lord, here is my life in its totality. Take of it what you will. I'll go where you want me to go. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll do what you want me to do. That we lack direction in our life when we have really not given all of ourselves to the care of the shepherd. Direction also comes in our life as we obey what we know to be God's will for today. 95% of the decisions which we make in life are already covered for us by the Word of God. 
They're not in any doubt at all as to what action is being called for. And I really see that the scriptures teach us that as we are faithful to the Lord, in doing those things which he calls upon us to do, which we already know are ours, as we obey him in that 95% area of our life, he takes care of the other 5%, and we find his direction then in the third way. By in that 5% where the guidelines are not clearly defined, he allows peace to be the arbiter of our decision. He allows that gentleness to arise within our heart that makes us know that we are walking in the right way. Peace. How do you know that a decision you are making is really in the Lord's way and will? Well, because the sheep know the shepherd's voice. And as you walk with the shepherd, you know when he is speaking to you and direction can be firm and safe. I'll not want. The Lord has his hands upon my life. Another reason why we do not want is that the good shepherd meets our need for protection. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I fear no evil. Thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. It's fascinating here to see the sequence of the psalm. That before one passes through the valley of the shadow of death, the Lord has already led before still waters and has led in green pastures. The Lord allows us the time during the daytime to prepare for the more difficult moments. And the shepherd does not have us going through the valley of the shadow of death until we have been adequately fed and prepared for that venture. The heaviest tests often come to a person in his later years. And this is certainly true with the 23rd Psalm and why it has been such a tremendous solace to persons in hospital beds and rest homes and persons who are aged, because that critical test is coming in this particular moment. The figure of speech, the valley of the shadow of death, arises from the fact that in the evening, when the shepherd was leading his sheep back to the sheepfold, he might have to pass through a narrow gorge, through a trail going through the gorge, entering into a valley, and as he passed through the valley, the shadow of the rocks or the cliff would throw its path across, and the sheep would need to walk from the sunshine through the shadow in order to come out into the sunshine again. And the fact that there was a shadow there could be a very frightening experience. And yet, in David, in applying this to his life and in the Holy Spirit, in applying it to our lives, will suggest to us that the wise person, by the time he comes into the valley of the shadow of death in his life, will have his priorities fixed and will have his shepherd so that he can go through the valley of the shadow with a shepherd rather than passing through it without one. Because the good shepherd himself has laid down his life for the sheep, there need not be any fear on the part of the sheep of passing through the valley of the shadow. For Jesus has made death a valley of shadow. You know, no mature adult is really afraid of a shadow. As a child, I could be afraid of shadows. In fact, uh, when we were up at... Uh, charismatic Lutheran camp this week, Camp Seely. Uh, one night on Wednesday night, they announced that there was a bear just across the bridge. And uh, boy, I'll tell you, uh, two little kids I had just began to quake in their beds about that bear that was beyond the bridge. And I quickly got rid of that fear by saying, there are no bears up in these mountains. And uh, I know the guy who made that announcement, he's probably just trying to scare the teenagers from going beyond the bridge. That didn't seem to do much work, but the, you know, the little kids... Uh, kept shaking, but I just knew there wasn't any danger besides the, the there was the door there, and then if there was a, was a bear, he couldn't come in. I wasn't really afraid of it. Come to find out the next morning that there really had been a bear. Uh, but anyway, you know, no, mature adults don't don't become afraid of stories. Uh, um, they're not afraid of shadows because there is nothing in a shadow that can hurt. The shadow of a dog cannot bite. The shadow of a sword cannot kill. The shadow of death cannot destroy. So the great trial of life is seen from David's perspective as a shadow. There is no want and there is no fear. In the early part of the psalm, verses 1 through 3, David has been speaking of God in the third person. He's been speaking of, He leadeth me, He restores, He leads me in paths of righteousness. But now as he's passing through the difficult trial, all of a sudden, he lapses into speaking of things in the first person. Thou art with me. Thou art with me. That personal relationship 
which is so cemented by going through difficulty. Friends can accompany us only so far, and then the Lord himself picks up and carries our journey even further. He goes with us through the valley of the shadow. And the shepherd has two protective instruments to watch out for us. His rod and his staff, they comfort me. The rod was a heavy club, which was used uh, to ward off wild animals. One didn't have a gun in those days as a shepherd. <laughs> the Winchester rifle had not yet been invented. So here they are with a great big club. And if uh, something fierce would come by or a robber would come by, the club is to be used on that thing which attempts to take away the security of the sheep. Whereas the staff was a slender pole with a crook around the end which could be used to guide the sheep in the event he began to stray or pull him back on the path by gently connecting with his leg or with his neck and steering him back in. It's very fascinating how the shepherd respectively used the staff and um, the, uh, the rod. The rod is not used on the sheep. The Lord does not club the sheep half to death to bring him back into the fold or to keep him from straying. The club is for the enemies. I've had to really, you know, it really dawned on me what, uh, how the Lord had led me in, in preaching from some sermons I heard uh, earlier in my life where the, the sheep uh, of the Lord, uh, because someone might be frustrated in preaching, could take out his frustrations on the sheep and beat them half within an inch of their lives. Now, the Lord wants to rebuke us at times, but he does it in a way that is his shepherd's staff with a gentility of bringing back. Where his correction is not given that he might kill us, but that he might restore us to the fold. So he protects. God, our shepherd, providing for our inner needs, giving us direction, providing for our protection in life. The metaphor changes in verses 5 and 6, where the psalmist sees the Lord not only as his shepherd, but as his host. I think it might be well to try to piece together what may have been the historical situation at this time. There are two passages of Scripture that I might just turn to to kind of indicate uh, the sort of backdrop that may have been running through David's mind before he composed the 23rd Psalm. His flight from Absalom is recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 15, and we see in verses 25 and 26 of 2 Samuel chapter 15 that the priest Zadok had... Uh, arranged for the Ark of the Covenant to be taken from the tabernacle and to be moved out into the wilderness with David. But David, when he sees the Ark of the Covenant, which is a sign of the presence of God, says to Zadok that that Ark of the Covenant should not be taken out into the wilderness. Rather, it should be left in Jerusalem. And David says at that time, if uh, uh, carry the Ark of the Lord back to the city, if I find favor in the eyes of the Lord, he will bring me back and let me see it and his habitation. But if he says, I have no pleasure in you, behold, here I am, let him do to me what seems good to him. In other words, David, as he begins that flight from Absalom, isn't sure what the outcome is going to be. He's not sure God is going to bring him back. And he's not sure that he'll ever be in the sanctuary, the tabernacle again. And isn't that kind of a response when we face into something where we need the shepherd psalm we're not sure if we're going to make it. We're human. We have feelings that things are going to maybe get messed up this time and that God isn't going to come through as he had in the past. And then as we move along in our journey, some other thoughts begin to come to us. Psalm 3 was evidently wit written uh, shortly after David had fled from Absalom. And uh, David in Psalm 3 is saying things like, Oh Lord, how many are my foes? Many are saying of me, there is no help for him in God. And the focus of the mind now is becoming upon the, the magnitude of the enemies. Not certain I'm going to make it back, but in that prayer, Psalm 3, David begins to say that on his journey he has learned not to be afraid of the ten thousands. He's, learned to beginning, he's beginning to learn to sleep at night without fear. And then there's a prayer to God. Oh God, deliver me. The outcome is not yet sure, but there is a measure of hope beginning to well up within him that God is going to come through. Psalm 23 sort of is a completion of those things. The beginning of the trip, he's not sure. Into the early part of the trip, he's praying for God's deliverance, but he's focusing in on his enemies. But in Psalm 23, there is that settled rest. There's no prayer for deliverance. 
for God is already setting a table before him and acting as his host. The enemies are not so much to be feared anymore, for he is being given a place to eat, a place of satisfaction in the midst of his enemies. In fact, these last two verses, 5 and 6, so interrupt the psalm, they appear so abruptly. Here we're talking about a shepherd, and all of a sudden the metaphor changes and we're talking about a host. But yet that's the very way that the Lord works in our life. All of a sudden we're going through something, and, and we wonder, uh, where is God? And then all of a sudden he shows up, just quite unannounced on the scene, with a full table spread. It's very fascinating how David may have gotten this figure of speech. The Lord sat at the table before me. We're in this uh, time of David's life when he was fleeing from Absalom. He's out in the wilderness for some time. And three men, who are not even uh, Israelis, bring him, in 2 Samuel chapter 17, verses 28 and 29, bring him beds, basins, earthen vessels, wheat, barley, meal, parched grain, beans, lentils, honey, curds, sheep, and cheese from the herd. For David and the people with him to eat. And they said, the people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. Someone came along and provided a tremendous meal for David. And he sees this evidently as a picture of the Lord's setting a table before us in the presence of our difficulties. And one is left kind of with a nighttime scene. And the enemies are outside the camp, but they can only look in. There is a protection. And one is allowed to take his refreshment in the midst of it. The Lord has come through again, is the message of Psalm 23. Facing into the struggle, you wondered, would the Lord come through? Psalm 23 is the answer. The enemies have pursued David, but so has God's goodness and mercy also pursued him. Someone has said that Psalm 23 makes no mention of the shepherd's dogs. And as we all know, the shepherds generally have dogs to help in the, sh in the herding of the sheep. So one writer has said, we have here in goodness and mercy the two collie dogs who help bring the sheep in. Goodness and mercy shall pursue me all the days of my life. I like the way David says the word surely. For that word is a certain word. It is a word which has moved uh, doubt into an absolute position of faith. God will come through. When I am with the Lord, life is indestructible. I am vulnerable. Things can get through to me. Enemies can attack me. But in the ultimate end, at the journey's end, the Lord has a table set for me. And how beautifully the Lord speaks of this in terms of the eternal feast, that he has a table spread for us. And that while all through life he has been acting as our host, in the age to come, he chooses once more to act as our host. And he sets a table before us, not one where there's just uh, something we don't like or just a little bit of something, but a full and and a benevolent table. Psalm 23 is not a prayer. Psalm 23 is not something coming from a person who wants a shepherd. Psalm 23 is a statement of faith by someone who rather than wanting a shepherd has found a shepherd and who can apply the shepherd's goodness to his life. And that finding of the shepherd is so beautifully reflected in the fact that at the beginning of this prayer, the word is Lord. Or at the beginning of this psalm, the word is Lord. And at the end of the prayer, the word Lord is again repeated, bringing things to a full circle. God with me as shepherd and host. Therefore, I shall not want. Let us pray. While this psalm, Lord, was not specifically written for people who did not have a shepherd, yet you say in John chapter 10 that you are the good shepherd of the sheep. And in other passages of scripture, you indicate that you want us to will to invite you in. That in order for you to be our shepherd, we must want that to be so. So, Lord, if there are hearts here today who have never known the work of your shepherding in their life and who would like the impact of a shepherd to provide security in them. May this psalm be a source of prayer and turning. Lord, I receive you and want you as shepherd. And Lord, for all of us in this place who at times in life Forget that your unseen hand is really guiding, guiding us to inner riches, 
in our soul, directing us through dangers, protecting us in the midst of adversity, being our host in a very difficult place. Pray today that this psalm will be a source of joy and comfort. Cause there to be, Lord, a filling of the Spirit in our lives as a result of addressing one another with this psalm. We thank you that you are our shepherd, our pastor. Through Christ our Lord. Amen.